Romans chapter 5, verse 3. You ever want to contradict the Bible? Like you read something in there and you say, nah, that's not right. <laughs> that's just not true. Not, not buying it, not going along with that one. I have to admit that I sometimes want to challenge God about things. I know, I know, he's always right. And when I disagree with him, I'm always wrong. But that doesn't always stop that instinctive, immediate first reaction when I read something in the Bible that I don't want to agree with. Well, here is one of those places this morning. We're in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Well, when I read that first phrase, we glory, and the word for glory is the same one that's translated rejoice in the previous verse, or back in two, I, he says, uh, we glory, we rejoice in tribulations. And my instinctive response is, no, <laughs> no, I, I don't so much rejoice in tribulations. No, I, I gripe in tribulation. I, I hate tribulation. I loathe tribulation. We don't want tribulation. We don't glory in it. We don't rejoice in it. And when we're going through it, we either want everybody to know how bad we've got it, or we don't want anybody to know how bad we're handling it. How can this be true that we glory in tribulation? Well, let's back up a little and look at it in context then. We saw verses uh, 1 through 3, or 1 and 2 rather, last week. And they talk about some of the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. Having been justified by faith when we believe in Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose from the dead and saves us, when we believe in Him, we are justified, declared righteous. And when that happens, we have peace with God. Now, we don't always feel or experience that peace because sometimes we live at odds with God. But peace with Him is our birthright in Christ, granted to us when we were born anew into God's family, purchased by the blood of Jesus. And then we also have access by faith in Jesus Christ, into this grace wherein we stand. When we trust Jesus Christ, that faith also grants us continual access to the grace of God, a standing in the unmerited favor, the undeserved blessings that God gives to us for all eternity. This reality, this standing, leaves us with an absolute confidence in our destiny that can give us an absolute confidence every day of our lives here on earth. Now, not all Christians feel blessed or enjoy those blessings or feel that confidence, but every believer in Christ has access continually to the grace of God because of their standing in Jesus Christ, and thus to the confidence that imparts. Then he says, not only that, but we also rejoice. We rejoice in hope. Now, not every Christian is actively rejoicing. If we did it automatically, without any need for a decision or an effort on our part, he wouldn't have to command us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We wouldn't need the command if it was something that we just automatically did without any thought, decision, or effort. But joy is also the birthright and ought to be the natural state and the continual activity of every believer in Jesus Christ. We access that joy in our relationship with Him by living for the glory of God. Well, okay, those things are obviously blessings. Tranquility, confidence, Joy, everybody says, man, those are good things. I want those. I like it that I have those in Christ. Now, not everybody's willing to live for God, believe in God, seek the glory of God. So not everybody fully enjoys those blessings, but everybody knows their blessings, likes to have them, wants to have them. But there's another one. And so Paul knows this one's going to seem like a stretch. This one's going to seem a little harder for everybody to say, oh yes, I agree. I'm right along with that one. So he words it a little differently. He says, and not only so, not just that stuff that you guys know is good and enjoy and like to hear about, not only so, not just that. There's one more blessing, a huge one. We glory in tribulations also. Same word again that he used for rejoice back there in verse 2. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We don't just rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We also rejoice in tribulations. Well, what? <laughs> we do? Not every Christian is actively rejoicing. Now, typically our behavior 
is more like we, we hide our tribulations because we don't want people to know what we're going through or how we're handling it as we go through it. Or we complain about our tribulations because we do want everybody to know what we're going through. Or we brag about our tribulations because we do want everybody to know just how strong we are and tough we are as we handle it. But what we're supposed to be doing, what we are in Christ, we're to praise God for His sustaining grace. We are to rejoice. We are to glory even in those tribulations. Even in COVID-19. Even wearing a mask, even during a lockdown, even during all of the hardships. The word tribulations there has the idea just of pressure, just of crushing pressure, problems, okay? When we face problems, we can still rejoice, no matter what those problems are. Now, this one flies in the face of nature. There's, there's three natural responses, I think, to tribulations and problems. One is just silence. Keep a brave face, the stiff upper lip. Keep a perfect exterior. People ask you, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How about you? Big smile on our face. Never let on that anything's wrong, that anything's bothering us, that we have any problems. That's, that's one, because we don't want to show any weakness. We don't want any pity. We don't want, you know, to involve other people, we'll rationalize it all kinds of ways. But we'll, okay, we'll basically lie about our lives to lots of people rather than acknowledge that we're facing tribulations, that we're going through a hard time. That's one natural, instinctive response that a lot of people use. A second natural, instinctive response that a lot of people use is to whine and complain. Hey, how you doing? Oh, well, I'm making it. it well, that is when I can walk because of my foot. And, oh, well, assuming I can breathe, this is bothering me. Oh, well, I can't drive because my car and my house has this. And I, did you hear about my grandma and, and her problem? And, you know, just to tell everybody everything about all the problems. and Just real, real negative, downhearted, complain, make it all about us and the problem. That's a second natural inclination. Tell everybody how bad we've got it, how terrible it all is, how we're not sure we're going to make it through this one. That's a second instinctive natural response. The third is, yes, we acknowledge the problem, and then we act like we can handle it ourselves. Tell everybody how bad it is, but stick our chin up and proclaim that we've got this. We'll make it through anyhow. You know, all of these responses are basically based on pride how we want others to perceive us. The image that we're trying to portray to other people. And that, John's going to call it the pride of life. That's our instinctive, natural response to problems, to make those problems about us, and then try to use them to shape the image that everybody else has of us. That's, that's not how we're supposed to be in Christ, though. It's not who we are in Christ. So this passage declares another option. That is, we glory. We rejoice in our tribulations. No stiff upper lip, brave face. Rather, a smile of rejoicing. We don't cover them up. We don't pretend that we're not having any problems and everything's peachy and there's no trouble. But we also don't whine and complain and murmur and gripe about them. We glory in them. And we don't brag about them as a testament to our own strength and endurance and power and all of that. We do instead rejoice in them. In James chapter 1, uh, verses 2 and 3, James says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. We praise God. We rejoice in testings and tribulations. This is the approach taken by the Apostle Paul, the guy that wrote this. He's not a whiner. You never get a hangdog spirit from him like, oh, woe is me. I, all this bad stuff's happened to me and I don't understand and I wish it hadn't and uh, hopefully I'll make it through somehow. You never get that sense from him. But we do know a lot of things that he went through. We know that people betrayed him because he told us so. We know that people let him down. He told us about it. We know that he was beaten. We know that he was whipped. We know that he was shipwrecked. We know he was rejected, scorned, schemed against, and people tried to kill him. In short, we know many of his tribulations. He didn't cover them up. But we also don't know of him as a braggart, as a boaster, as testifying of his own power and pressing through those things. 
through those things, he never spoke in braggadocious terms, and he never spoke in discouragement and depression. Hold your finger here and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to kind of bounce between these two passages this morning because this is a tough concept. This rejoicing in tribulation, this praising the Lord in COVID-19 and in lockdown and in recession, and this praising the Lord in health problems and social problems and political problems and financial problems, these pressures that are on us, this legitimate, genuine rejoicing in this is a hard concept for us to grasp and to apply. So Paul explains it in Romans. He's saying, what do you get when you get Jesus Christ? Well, you get the unnatural, impossible ability to rejoice in your problems. But he demonstrates it in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4 is an illustration from Paul's own life of how he handled the tribulations that came to him. He models it for us there. So we're going to kind of bounce back and forth looking at the development of this process in his own life. 2 Corinthians 4, uh, I'm just going to read through the passage from verses 7 through 18, then it will bounce back and forth between watching them. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 7. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Can you hear the sound of triumph in that passage? The testimony of praise and worship to the glory and honor of God? Under what circumstances? Troubles on every side. Distressed, persecuted, cast down, brought to the point of death. And yet he says, praise God. He's excited. He's, he's rejoicing. He's glorying in the problems to the glory of God. This is not the sound of someone defeated. This is the sound of someone who has tranquility and confidence and joy because he knows that the power of God is greater than any trial he will face. He knows that the trials are worth it, that he will make it through, and he will even take joy in the journey. All right, so holding your finger there because we're going to keep glancing back and forth between them. Back over to Romans chapter 5. He said, we rejoice in tribulation because we know that tribulation works patience. See, we don't enjoy the tribulation for its own sake. It's not fun. Nobody said it was fun. Nobody said that being sick or being hurt or being in financial distress or having family problems, uh, losing loved ones, nobody said that those things were enjoyable. What we rejoice in is what those things produce the product of those processes. And he says the product of tribulation is patience. Now the idea of tribulation, again, is that of pressure, affliction, or trouble. And the idea of patience in the Bible is not just calmness or not reacting to provocation. 
That's usually what we think of as patience. Somebody just sitting calmly, not really doing anything. They're being patient. They're waiting. Good things come to those that wait. Or not reacting to provocation. Their kids have been all up in their hair all day long, and still they're responding with a gracious, uh, positive, loving kind of tone. Uh, that's how we think of patience. And those are elements of patience. But the real idea in the Bible is that of endurance. Patience in the Bible is not doing nothing. Patience in the Bible is doing the right thing, no matter what, as long as it takes. It's endurance. You have a race, a course that's set before you. And the impatient person turns aside. The impatient person stops and sits down. The patient person is the one who, not sitting down, runs the race, keeps on going until they finish the course. They are the person who doesn't stop doing what's right until it's done. It's endurance. And just like you don't get physical endurance by sitting on the couch or by doing an easy workout, you don't get spiritual endurance, patience, without pressure and pain. The affliction of tribulation imparts the strength of endurance. This is what it does. It changes our character. It shapes and alters our behavior to make us more like Christ, to make us more enduring. What does this do for us? Back in James chapter 1, I read verses 2 and 3 a moment ago. Here's verses 2 through 4 of James 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So patience isn't the end goal. Patience isn't the end point. Patience produces even more good fruit in our lives. We learn the patience from the tribulations. We learn how to keep on doing what's right, no matter what, for as long as it takes, by the problems that we go through. But having learned to keep pressing on, doing what's right, no matter what, that brings us to maturity. That's the idea of perfection. Not that a person is sinlessly perfect without any flaws, errors, or mistakes, but rather that they are mature, that they are complete, that they're a grown-up. Uh, I use the illustration um, with Michael Jordan. I know it's starting to date me a little bit because kids today were never alive when Michael Jordan played, but uh, still the argument rages on whether he was the greatest basketball player of all time. And the reason that argument rages on is because Michael Jordan was the perfect basketball player. That is, he could play defense. He was good. The man could handle the ball. He was really good handling the ball. He could pass incredibly well. He could drive from outside, take it to the hoop, and slam it on anybody. He could shoot from outside. The man was deadly as an outside shooter. He played the entire game of basketball without any glaring weaknesses. There were other players that were very good at various elements of the game, but merely adequate in others. Michael Jordan could do it all and do it all well. He was a complete basketball player. That doesn't mean that being the perfect basketball player, he never missed a shot. Michael Jordan missed a lot of shots. He wasn't perfect in the sense of sinless perfection, never missing a shot. He was perfect in the sense that he was the, the real deal, the total package, a complete product. He could play the whole game and play it well. It's like that with Christianity. In this life, we are never going to be sinlessly perfect where we never make a misstep, never say a wrong thing, or fail to speak when we should have spoken, etc. We're never going to be sinlessly perfect in this life. But we can be mature. We can be complete. We can have a Christian life that when someone or God himself looks at us, there's no glaring weakness that can be exploited. That when Satan comes to attack, there's no obvious chinks in our armor because patience has had its perfect work, making us perfect and entire so that we would want nothing. We would be the total package, the real deal as a Christian. Now that's the generality there in James, that patience perfects us. But what is the process by which it does that? That's back here in Romans 5. Romans 5 verse 4, he said, Knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience. So patience 
steadfastly, unflinchingly, doing the right thing, no matter what, as long as it takes, that gives us experience. And the idea of experience is proof. Patience produces proof. Experience is having gone through a trial and proven something. Like the proving grounds that Chrysler has. They will put the cars on trial. And when the car comes through that trial, something has been proven. Something has been demonstrated. There is something that is incontrovertibly true for it has been observed and experienced. Patience does that for us. We come through doing what's right. And when we get to the end of the situation, something has been proven. We have an experience. When you endure as long as it takes, you prove something about yourself and your faith. And more importantly, you prove something about God. You prove that you can make it through. But as believers, we know that we don't make it through because we are strong. We make it through because He is strong. We make it through by His sustaining grace. And when we do that, we receive the experience of being upheld by God. We see that He does see us through. We walk through the fires like the young men in the song, like the young men in Daniel. We walk through the fire and realize that God was with us the whole way. And that God used that for His glory. That God used that to burn the ropes off us and set us free. We have that experience because we had that endurance. If we had quit, you think of those young men in Daniel. If they had quit when they got called on the carpet in front of the king, yeah, sure, they stood when it was just them and a big crowd of people and nobody was paying any attention. But if they had quit when the going got rough and it got real and they could feel the flames on their face, if they had said, oh, oh sir, sir, okay, yeah, sir, we'll, we'll be glad to bow down. I'm sorry, sir, we didn't mean to upset you there. If they had quit then, they would not have had that experience. They would not have seen the proof of the presence of God with them. They would not have known His freeing and transformative and glorifying power through that experience if they had quit when it was hard. You don't get the proof. You don't get the experience unless you have the patience to keep doing what's right as long as it takes. When we do that, we see that He does see us through. We see that He does work it together for good. We come through the fires of trial proven and purified and refined. We gain experience. Now, after a year like 2020, we want to say, I've got so much experience in tribulation, I'm overqualified for that job now. But really, you can't experience too much of the sustaining grace of God in your life. You can't experience too much of His upholding hand. You can't prove too much your faith or His faithfulness. God always comes through. And when we stick to doing what's right for Him and with Him, we gain the experience of seeing that firsthand. Remember back in 2 Corinthians 4? Back in verse 12, Paul said, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. That is, Paul was patient. Trouble on every side, perplexed, persecuted, cast down, bearing about the dying of the Lord Jesus. He went through all of that, and having done so, he saw life working in the people that he ministered to. He was patient. He stuck with serving God through the tribulations right into the face of death itself, and he got the experience of seeing the people of Corinth come to Christ and live for him. Life. The life of God worked in those people because Paul had the patience to endure the tribulations and keep on testifying and keep on witnessing and keep on going for Jesus Christ. Paul's patience worked experience. It produced proof both of his faithfulness and of God's faithfulness. The second part there of Romans 5.4, patience works experience and experience hope. Experience produces expectation. That's what hope is in the Bible. We talked about that some last week. Hope is not just a vague wish, an idle thing that you would like to see happen. Hope is expectation. Hope is faith applied to the future. Once you've been through those fires once, 
and survived and proven your faith and proven God, when you see the fire approaching again, you go through them with the expectation that God will bring you through. That God will make this work out to His glory. That God's will will be proven good and acceptable and perfect. That God's grace will sustain you. Remember 2 Corinthians 4 again? Having shown us his experience in verse 12, he's seen life working in them. Verses 13 and 14 then show his expectation. He says, We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. He had an expectation for all eternity because of the experience that he had, because of the patience, the endurance that he had. We rejoice because of this process of endurance that produces experience, that leads us to great expectations of the work and the power of God. Verse 5 then of Romans uh, 5. It says, and hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So hope, that experience that produced that expectation, that expectation does not make a shame. Uh, shame in the Bible. Sometimes the idea of embarrassment or blushing, but more normally that of being let down. Like, boy, I was really hoping the Mets were going to have a good year this year but it's the Mets, and they let me down again. Or the Giants, as the case may be, or the Lions, as the case may be. I was really hoping for this, but ah, didn't work. They lost, they let me down. He says, this hope that we get from this expectation, that we got from that experience, that we got from that endurance, it is never let down. It always comes through. When your hope is formed from experience and your experience came from patience and your patience came from tribulation, that hope never gets let down. It's solid. It's an expectation grounded in the character and work of God and that always comes through. Back over in 2 Corinthians 4, as we observe this process, verses 16 through 18, we see the ultimate end of Paul's tribulations, patience, experience, and hope. Verse 16, For which cause we faint not? For though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that persecution, tribulation, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul looked, expected an eternal weight of glory. Something far greater, more massive, more lasting than the tribulations he'd been through. Proverbs, we've been going through that uh, both on YouTube and on Wednesday nights. Proverbs tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. That tree of life, of fulfilled expectation, is there for every Christian who glories in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation works patience, the patience works experience, the experience works hope, and that hope comes true. Why? How does this really work in our lives? So last week, we saw that the key to rejoicing was living for the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is the key to rejoicing even in tribulation? To glorying in tribulation, making it through this process with joy the way we're supposed to. Well, he gives it to us. Hope makes not a shame, back in Romans 5.5, 5, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. This is all accomplished because of the love of God in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. When we know Jesus, when God brings us through tribulation, when we experience this process, 
we also experience the love of God in our hearts. This is God's love to us that calls upon us to love Him in return. Now, you notice, and, and we'll, we know God's love because of historical fact, what Jesus did for that. He'll talk about that in a few verses. But this is the personal experience of God's love that sustains us through to see the outcome of our hope, our expectation. I think that without the tribulations, without the endurance, without the experience, without the expectation, we would not feel or display the love of God as strongly as we can in Christ. And this is not just some passive process or natural outcome of this learning experience. This, is, this experience of God's love is something that God Himself is doing actively in us. His Holy Spirit, God Himself within us, is pouring out His love. This is an active process on the part of God, a response to our endurance and our glorying in tribulation. A love that penetrates to the depths of our souls and shines as brightly as a city on a hill. Now, noteworthy here, little doctrinal point, every believer in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit. He says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. I'm not going to dig into the minutia of the grammar here, but the verb tenses show that that is given unto us would be equivalent in time to when we were justified by faith. It, it tracks to the leading verb of the passage and this is something that happens when we believe in Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost is given unto us. We don't need a secondary experience after salvation in order to receive the Holy Ghost. He is given unto us when we believe in Jesus Christ, are justified by faith, and uh, when, when we come to know Christ. This idea of being shed abroad. What is, the, what is the work of the Holy Ghost in us now that we've received Him? Uh, it depends on which church you go to, what emphasis you're going to get from the Holy Ghost, right? Well, at least in this passage, the work of the Holy Ghost in our hearts is not to make us speak in tongues or to perform faith healings or do big dramatic attention getting miracles or things. What does the Holy Ghost do in us that makes it so that our hope is never ashamed, our expectation is never let down? He helps us through the trials by love, the love of God. Now you notice that it's the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. That is, it doesn't stop with us. It flows through us. It's sourced in our heart. That's where the Holy Spirit is working. But it's shed abroad in our hearts. It works its way out through what we do and how we live to the people around us so that we become characterized by the love of God. A love that we have for God and a love that God has for us is then shed abroad, sourced in our hearts. Remember 2 Corinthians 4 again, where Paul was facing those troubles and perplexity and persecution and all of those things? How did he handle those things, yet keep on pressing forward, knowing that his expectation would not be disappointed? Well, it's in verses 15 and 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, here's his mindset as he goes through this. He says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What cause? He was living for others. He says, all this stuff I'm going through, these tribulations, these beatings, these shipwrecks, this perplexity, this distress, all of these pressures and trials, you know I'm going through this for your sakes. Our tendency when we face trials is to make them about us. But if that's the case, we haven't learned the first lesson of the Christian life yet, and that is that it's not about us. We aren't about us. We exist to the glory of God and for the good of others. It's not about us. So Paul says all these problems, it's for your sakes. 
I'm looking for your thanksgiving to redound to the glory of God. And because of my mindset toward you, hey, I don't quit. We faint not. Even though they kill our outward man, even though it feels like I'm dying every day here, my inward man is renewed. I still have joy. I rejoice in these trials because I know that it's really for you what I'm doing. Instead of looking inward at himself where all the pain was. Instead of looking at the struggles and troubles and trials. He looked outward to those whom he could help. Again, usually when we face tribulations, we make ourselves the focus. Why is this happening to me? We'll spiritualize it. Lord, what am I supposed to learn from this? What am I supposed to understand? What do I need to do to make it stop? And this the whole point that a lot of the time... It's not about us. The lesson we needed to learn was that. That sometimes the trial isn't for us. Sometimes tribulation isn't to teach us some great spiritual truth. Sometimes it's simply something that we need to endure with joy in order to somehow help someone else or to proclaim Christ even through it. To demonstrate His sustaining grace in it. But it's not about us. And as long as our focus and our mindset in the Christian life is on us, myself, me, I, we're never going to have joy. We won't have that renewal of the inward man. We'll be choking up the love of God in our hearts, begging for more and more of it ourselves without spreading it abroad, without letting it be shed abroad from our hearts to others. It's not about us. What do we learn? We learn that it's about Christ and it's about others. So, what is our response to tribulation? How do we react to this? Is it shame? Is it anger? Is it frustration? It wasn't Paul's because he was looking at somebody else. How can we have rejoicing? Well, verse 2, by living in hope of the glory of God by putting the glory of God first in our lives. Can we live in that rejoicing as Christians all the time, even in 2020? Yeah. We can even glory in the problems. We can glory, rejoice in our infirmities, not whining, not covering up, not bragging, but bravely enduring, patiently doing what's right. Because the love of God has touched our lives. We let that flow into us and through us and from us. And that springs up in our lives by the Holy Spirit that God gave us when we trusted Christ. And when we let that love flow through us, living for others for the glory of God, we can glory in tribulation. We can have joy in anything. You know, the Scriptures tell us that we should flee temptation, but glory in tribulation. My personal observation and experience is that often we do the opposite. We glory in temptation and we flee from tribulation. We don't want any problems. We don't want any of that. And you know, Paul was human too, right? I've been reading from 2 Corinthians. uh, But in 2 Corinthians 12, we get another example where Paul prayed to God for the Lord to take away one of his problems. He had a thorn in his flesh, some kind of physical ailment that he had sent from Satan to give him trouble. And he said, God, please take this thing away from me. But even in that, God told him, no, God's grace would sustain him. And what did Paul say in response? He said, ah, All right, if I gotta. Verses 9 and 10 of 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then... Am I strong? You catch that? Such an otherworldly mindset. I take pleasure in being reproached. I take pleasure in having needs. I take pleasure in being distressed. I mean, it's the situation that 
we're in now or, or will be as the years progress here in the U.S., perplexed at times, distressed at times, persecuted at times, reproached at times, facing weaknesses of our body and weaknesses of our souls. And he says, I'm happy about that. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought you were only supposed to be happy if you were strong, if you were, you know, able and capable and competent and could handle it all. No, he says, I can't. I can't. That's why I asked God for help. And instead of taking the problem away, he said, I'll give you my strength instead. Now, which would you rather have? The problem without God's strength or the problem with God's strength? Which would you rather have? No problem, but no power of God or problem and power of God. But we want the no problem and power of God. That combination is rarely an option. We glory in the problems because in them we know God better. In them, we experience God's work in our lives. In them, we come to expect God's work in the future. In them, we glorify God. And what did we rejoice in? The glory of God. So we can rejoice even now, even wearing our masks, even with a disease sweeping the world, even with political upheaval, even with economic uncertainty even with a culture turning against Christianity, even with whatever. Take your pick. doesn't matter. We can rejoice. We glory in these things. Not because we're strong and we're going to get through, but because we love others through them for the glory of God. And we know that as we do that, these trials will teach us patience. That patience will give us experience. That experience will increase our hope. And that hope will never be let down. Everybody faces tribulations, saved, unsaved. Everybody has problems. Everybody has pressures and hard times. But as believers, it is our birthright in Christ, the product of our justification, to face those problems in the power of God, for the glory of God, expressing the love of God instead of concern for ourselves. And so it becomes the mark of a believer that we can glory in tribulations. So instead of complaining about our problems, let's rejoice in them. Instead of trying to act like they don't exist and everything's hunky-dory and fine and we don't have any problems, what are you talking about? Everything's perfect. Acknowledge them. Instead of fleeing them, accept them with open arms. No, the, the problems aren't good themselves. They aren't enjoyable themselves. They really are hard and they really do hurt. Just ask Paul. He knows. But they're worth it. For what they work in our lives. So let's get our eyes off of ourselves and look for what we can do for others in the love of God that He may be glorified in us and them.